Are we up? Yes, looks like we're up. Good morning, good morning, good morning. <laughs> That's what she said. Okay, whatever. Good morning, good morning, gang. Gray, gray day in Tokyo here this morning. A little bit on the cool side, but nonetheless, a nice, uh, a nice day. As long as it doesn't rain. Has someone left their bike there? I don't know. I would guess one of the people that work at the uh, at the restaurant next door. Perhaps I don't know. We have our booster coming in for a landing. <laughs> Whose bike? I don't know. It's not a bike I've seen before. I don't know. There are people who, you know, uh, live close to Asakusa who wouldn't come by train, who would walk or come by bike. So uh, they can't park their bikes on the street, Hopidori, the street where all the bars are. There's absolutely no place to put a bicycle there. It's completely impossible. So we do see this late afternoon, evening, whatever. We'll see if I'm outside. I'll see someone come, look around for a place to drop their bike, drop it, lock it, then head off to the bar street. And my first guess, without knowing anything more about it, is that just somebody, somebody, you know, dropped their bike here, went for a drink, and then either, whatever, they forgot that they had their bike here, or they were not capable of taking a bike home. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> In that case, you know, they, they, whatever, stumbled home, and they will come back today, um, where did I leave my bike? My hair, we rearranged, somebody changed the light up top, there's a light up there that's shining on me, so I don't know. Idea. No idea. Okay, okay. Let's uh, uh, let's get to work. It'll be it'll be surfer carving today. Continuing on the uh, surfer, the surfer blocks. I'm not sure where we left off. Did we finish one of the blue ones? I don't know. Is there a problem with biking while intoxicated? It is illegal. It's considered to be in control of a vehicle, and if you ride too fast on a sidewalk or if you hit somebody, you're in trouble. Uh, they will ticket you, absolutely. They will also, if they feel like they've got nothing to do, they will flag over a bicycle and say, can I see your registration, the bicycle sticker? Uh, and what's the other thing? Oh yeah, you're not supposed to ride one-handed. If it's raining, you're not supposed to ride with an umbrella in one hand and the bike in the other. And they will maybe ticket you for this if they feel like they have nothing else to do. Wait, what have we got here? Junk on the desk. Oh, we have, this is today's show and tell. It's, uh, you can keep your socks. There's no problem. It'll just be a normal, it's a, it's a few older prints coming in. They will be going, they're not for the collection. They will be going into the flea market. But that's today's show and tell. Uh, this is not show and tell, but let's open it to get it out of the way. Let's take a peek at this one, just so you can see what it is. This is not show and tell. It's not Yahoo Auction stuff. It's fun stuff for me, but uh, it's also the box didn't need to be this big, so I'm not quite sure what else is in there. It has been opened by customs as well when it came through. Ooh, 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 ooh. Good thing we are not playing games with our declarations. Well, I see. It's way thicker just because of the extra packing. I was thinking there might have been a there might have been bonus goods in there, but no. Any guesses? Oh. oh, I see. No, no, it's the green tape. Okay, I see, I see, I see, I see. Green tape. No, it's the green tape that I put on it when I sent it out because I have sent these prints out of here and now they are coming back. So the green tape is mine. I put this on this package when I sent this out of here a few weeks ago. What can happen? Let's just cut it. Someone says Kubota because it does indeed look like Kubota boards and the boards are from Kubota, but I reused them. I recycled them.
Someone's been reading it. <laughs> it says Ukiyo-e Heroes. These are woodblock prints, Ukiyo-e Heroes prints that we sent over to Jed a couple of weeks ago for signing. They are now back from Jed, happily signed and sealed. And there's Jed's equivalent of green tape. It's blue tape from Utah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So, 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 the boards came from Kubota-san. They're good. These are the boards that we use for drying our prints. Dave, be careful. Be careful, be careful, be careful. I see. So here we are. And the, the deal is this. We make the prints here, of course. Jed designs them over there at his home. We cut the blocks and we do the printing. But the prints can't be sold as they are from us because when we make the prints, they don't have the authenticity. So every one of the UQA Heroes prints, every one of them is sent over to Jed. Jed looks at them, inspects them, clears them. He puts his seal on. This seal is impressed by Jed. It's not carved into the blocks. Jed puts the seal on and then of course, he signs it in pencil, puts his, the current year on and then he numbers them. And these are not limited edition numbers. These are just showing what we're up to. So this is Mario Kart print number 1859. So we're up to nearly 2,000 on those as well. And normally what happens with the prints then is after we've sent them to Jed, he signs them. They go for sale on his website. We don't sell online the Ukiyo-e Heroes prints. You've got to get them from the man himself, ukiyoeheroes.com. But here in the shop, we also want to sell them. People expect them. So we have bought these back from Jed. He bought the physical prints from us, but now that they are signed, we buy them back from him at a wholesale price and put them in our shop to sell them at retail. It's a bit of a go round, go round, but it has to be done that way. If Jed were here in Japan, he would drop over to the workshop once in a while, sign a bunch of the prints, and we could split them up and send them out from there. These are the original box. We've recarved nothing. We've retouched nothing. We've recarved nothing. These are the same actual blocks. Nothing has changed. This is the we have the video on the website of me doing this, and the blocks are still well. There you are. There's the mustache. There's the fingers. Can you see any block wear and tear? The delicacy on the uh, on the, the squid. The eyeballs are still there. All the delicate tracery in the strings. Nearly 2,000 copies. Look at this. Also, look at all this, the fine detail in here. This is what happens. This this huge myth out in the world. What about prints? You're 200 copies, that's it. The blocks are worn out. You're dead. No, 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 no. 200 maximum, maximum. Oh, my God. That's why we do limited editions. No, no, no. Good wood, take care of your blocks, print not too many copies at the same time, and you can roll. You can roll forever and ever and ever. I don't know, forever and ever and ever. We're finding out. We're in the process of finding out. Yes, the same blocks, 200, 2,000 copies, and it still isn't showing signs of wear. I mean, even if they started to show a few signs of wear, we could still make prints from them. These haven't even started to show wear yet. 200 copies, 200 copies, all you can get from woodblock prints, blah, 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 blah. Okay, let's get some work done. Where are we? We are partway through clearing out, so it's gonna be a little bit of crunch time today. It'll be crunch, crunch work. The wood was cherry wood, cherry wood. Got to plug in the camera. The battery just ran out. It wasn't plugged in. Excuse me one second. Don't panic. Don't panic.
plug had a, we, we keep it plugged in all the time. It has a battery attached to it. We, we run it, we keep it plugged in all the time. Someone says paper out. There is actually no paper out today because nobody's upstairs today and the same for tomorrow. This weekend it's a real quiet, <laughs> not quiet, but quiet weekend. All the staff is out. It's just going to be me and one staff member to help each day in the shop. It's been nuts nuts the last few days we've set records it's it's back to before what it was in 2019 after an initial couple of weeks we opened in early october after an initial couple of quiet weeks it has gone berserk we're busy all day long people are coming in Dave! and then there's the people that come in and like what is this place <laughs> <laughs> and we're we're running out of everything just everything we're running out of Yoshida prints doi prints our own stuff. the cats the eight views of cats they're just running out of here like my god what an absolute home run they are the printers have all been put on notice that's it get to your desks get the chains on get busy it has gone nuts, nuts. Anybody's, are the ninjas helping us? No, it's a, there's no overlap whatsoever between the ninja crowd and our crowd. Zero, zero. The ninja crowd is families with four, five, six-year-old kids. That's the ninja crowd for the people across the street. Our crowd are enjoying this because what happens, like yesterday, 10 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 2 o'clock, 4 o'clock, four times a day, sometimes five times a day, the, they get to the point in their activity when they start the outside scene with all the swords and stuff. And the screaming starts. So the, the people, the visitors, the guests who are in our shop looking at Woodbuck prints, they hear the screaming and the kids yelling and hit him, hit him, hit him. So I tell them, it's time to see the ninja show. And we all gather at the front door and watch the show. Okay, let's get some crunch work done today here. We're going to clean off around the outside of these things. But the ninja guys also, they have gone, uh, they've gone ballistic. Uh, clearly, whatever it was, the television show they had last week has clearly, clearly changed them dramatically. And their orders must be way up. They've booked new staff. They were training some more yesterday. While they were doing the thing, they were also training new staff. So... Uh, So Asakusa is now officially jumping. It's alive again. And there's also, certainly from our own experience here and from what I see in media reports and stuff, there's been none of the expected problems between foreigners who refuse to wear masks and between, you know, normal people here. The people, the foreigners who have come to visit Japan, to a large extent, whatever, 90x percent, are cooperating with the local customs. They're, they're wearing masks where they're asked to. There's been no dramatic you know, chaos. And, you know, for the past few months, the Japanese have been paranoid about this. Oh my God, what's going to happen when the tourists come back? Nothing has happened at all. It's just back to normal. They should have opened the doors months ago. Absolutely months ago. So it's a free ninja show, so, so.
but for us we we really don't know what to do we we're doing all we can we're making as many prints as we can but we can no longer they're leaving the shop far faster than we are than we are able to make it So it is kind of frustrating that you know to have the shop open and to have so many people here and to not have the product that they want you know John saying travel group in Facebook. Yeah, interest has exploded. I get it. I get it. I get it. I can see it. We're here at the point of the spear here. And of the volume, it's not yet what it was in 2019, but it's clearly it's coming back. And the, the barrier now is the air flight. The airplanes are, of course, booked solid, and the flights are still much more expensive than they were a couple of years ago. So what we could be seeing here is a sort of a surge, the people who really desperately wanted to go, and they're going to come anyway, no matter how expensive the planes are. So this could be sort of a, a bump. The desperate people are here. Then once they're, once they're out and through, I think we'll slump down. This winter could be a you know, fairly long, cold winter with not too many tourists. And then it will take, I think, a year, a couple of years to build up really to the levels we had before. So I think this thing we're seeing right now is just simply the surge, the, the backup surge. I certainly hope so, because we need a bunch of quiet months, January, February, before the spring comes, to get busy and make more prints. At the current rate, we're gone. This shop will be empty in whatever, I don't know, two weeks, three weeks. We'll have nothing interesting left. You know, it'll just be the leftovers at the current rate. You know. They don't grow on trees. Zoom in a bit more, I guess. I'm not sure. If I zoom in too close, I end up being off camera a lot. Of, so let's see if we can get closer. Someone says, time to hire more printers. Why didn't I think of that? That's it, of course. Come 9 o'clock this morning, I'll just get on the phone and call up a few people and say, come on over. Hey, would you like to be a woodblock printmaker? <laughs> Why don't I just hire more printers? <laughs> I didn't think of that.
the sounds you're hearing out back now, this is scaffolding going up. The building, how do you describe it? Behind us, behind us next building down, the one that was demolished uh, during part of last year. Construction has now started on it, on the new building to replace it. So it shouldn't be too noisy for a while. They're putting up the scaffolding first. I guess then they'll be pouring concrete, that sort of stuff. There shouldn't really be anything awfully noisy about it. The demolitions are much worse than the construction. So. Someone says they're calling me, I'm in the country already, no need for visa support. You are a completely you know, competent, fully fledged printer, craftsman? If so, then let's talk. But uh, we're, we need uh, printers, like people who actually know the job. I know I'm not sure who you are or, or what your situation is. We need printers, you know, like trained, competent woodblock printmakers. Start training, and I'll start training five years ago, please, and we'll be ready for you. My visa, I do have a visa. I'm still an alien. I'm not a Japanese citizen, so I have a visa. And if I misbehaved myself, if I did something illegal and was, was you know, uh, convicted of something, I would lose my residency status and be kicked out. I'm not permanent here. I mean, I have a, a permanent residence. As long as I keep my nose clean, I'm fine. Dave has a better. Keep talking about my hair. What's going on with my hair today? My hair is just hair. How? Somebody in the shop was on about that yesterday as well. My hair is just hair. Recently, I have the feeling that actually I'm losing it faster because uh, in, over the past few years or so, I wasn't I know, washing it heavily every day. I'd wash my hair a couple times a week. But now because of the pool routine, I do the swim. You know, I swim for a kilometer each morning, five days a week on the on weekdays. So, of course, part of that, you're in the water and uh, you're getting a shower and all that kind of stuff. So my, my head and my hair get washed more often these days than, than, than before. anything else. I don't own a comb. I don't have a hairbrush. I don't own a comb. I don't do anything else. Dave's tips <laughs> for hair care.
get a pool cap. Of course I wear a cap, it's mandatory. You can't swim in a pool in Japan without having a cap, of course. When I joined that, that fitness center just a year ago, I joined, uh, actually I joined a year ago next week on my birthday. When I joined the fitness center, I knew, of course, there's no, to get in the pool you have to have a cap. What I was worried about was they may have asked for a, a beard cover as well. Some, some uh, no, centers do, but this one doesn't care, so I'm, I'm free. But of course I wear a cap, everybody does. You can't go in a swimming pool, a public swimming pool in Japan without a cap, period. Let's take less time to become a competent, apparently competent carver. It's, it's sort of apples and oranges. There's a big, 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 big difference in that to, to do printing, there's some printing work is really, really very simple and easy. You know, some printing jobs actually involve a single color on a piece of paper and out, out she goes. So you can train, and you know, if you're in the middle of a printing workshop, you can come in and you can actually be productive on day one if there is simple scaled work ready for you. So, and that's what happened in the old days. A printer's workshop would be a mix of people who just started, medium experts all the way along. And because it was the printing business, there were simple jobs, medium jobs, and difficult jobs. So a printer could be productive and functional on day one, assuming he was a normally competent human being who could sort of follow instructions and do something. Carving doesn't work like that. You can't sit here with a knife and here's how you hold a knife and start to sharpen it and do something and produce work that's going to be productive and selling on day one. So there's that massive difference. A printer could start and get paid and have something to do right from the beginning but when a carving workshop had a young boy coming in, they knew he was going to be a dead weight for a long, long time before he can be productive. So that difference is still there. Now, one factor involved in that, though, is in a printing workshop these days, there isn't much really simple work to do. You know, we sell complicated prints. Nobody is going to want to buy a little childish print made from one color. So we don't have a whole lot of pr simple work left anymore. But the concept is still the same. You can climb a ladder slowly when you're a printer. But with a carver, the steps of the rung are very, very large, much larger. So what they would have done in the, in the old days in a workshop, a young carver coming in would have been assigned to do work like what I'm doing now. This is not specifically very high-skilled work. You've got to know what you're doing, you've got to be careful with it. But the carver coming in would be able to do clearing work first and then spend time practicing with the knife cutting lines and things. So he would be productive as an assistant at first, the young carvers. But that that assumes then the existence of an actual workshop with a bunch of different people sitting side by side and producing prints together. When you're all by yourself and you're not sharing the work, the carver has to be totally productive, beginning to end, before you can earn anything. So, exactly, it's San Jose's got it. There was, there was advertising work, there were book pages. They're the biggest thing. The, the printer who would start on day one, absolutely, uh, in many workshops, would have been printing books, book pages. You know, just books, one. Slap some color on, slap, 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 go. Slap some color on, slap, 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 go. Anybody could do that. Five minutes of training and we're in. So if I were a book publisher back in the days, the carvers are your really high-skilled, high-paid, team and printers are whatever just hire them off the street if you were a book publisher if you remind me when I get up here to, to go to get the show and tell stuff ready I can just quickly grab a book page and show you anybody could do that work on day one literally and I said that's no exaggeration if you were a book publisher you had your blocks ready you could drag people off the street to do the printing. It's that simple, absolutely that simple. Now, unfortunately for us, we don't have that kind of printing waiting for us. We have multicolored, difficult, multi-registration.
But yeah, if I were a book publisher in 1850, I would not have labor problems. As long as there's warm bodies out on the street, you've got your product. This block seems to be taking a long time. I guess I've just been fooling around with too many other jobs. Yeah, the farmers also came to town. That's, that was very much a thing. That that's backs up what I'm saying. In winter, up in the north part of the country, the Tohoku area, once the rice harvest was in and once the snow came, bang, not everybody, but a lot of young men did head for town because there was work waiting for them. So there was a winter exodus from Tohoku down into Edo. There were dormitories, all kinds of places they could stay. And they do all kinds of work, not just woodblock printmaking, but in the field that I understand well, woodblock printmaking, there we are. There's work for those boys. As I said, printing, 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 printing books. Training. Sit down, boy. Here's your baron. Let me show you what to do. Five minutes. Get busy. And then come the spring, back they would go up to, up to the North Country and get planting rice. And If you're so busy, my God, I can't read all this. I can't catch it all this. I'm sorry. Did I find out what was wrong with those three great wave prints? Yes, there's a section of blue that's misregistered. One of the blues along the bottom. She was pretty strict about it, but yes, they are prints that shouldn't have gone out. I didn't have to call her. We, we did look it up, actually. So this, for those of you who don't know, yesterday's great wave prints, there were three marked as not so good, and they were indeed not so good. They shouldn't have gone out. So. If, again, if you remind me, the prints are still right here. I haven't sent them to Oma yet. So when we get the show and tell time, remind me, I can pull them out and show you. It's not embarrassing for her. It's fine. She did a spectacular, spectacular job. Remind me later on. I've got some music, you know, it, when I went to the 7-Eleven, they've got BGM playing in the 7-Eleven, you know, and it, it's really, it's about the bizarrest BGM you have ever heard in your life. I don't know if all 7-Elevens are the same, I don't know, the one next to me here, whether it's BGM supplied by the 7-Eleven franchise or whether it's just something the local owner has tapped into, I don't know. But the, 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 the BGM at this local 7-Eleven is just, it's sometimes absolutely bizarre. Absolutely bizarre. And this morning they were playing Boston. More than a feeling. Go up there. I got my lunch. You know, today, because we're in the shop here today, I have no time later on to go get lunch. So I went to go get my lunch early, just before the stream started, about 7.30. I go up the street there in the 7-Eleven and then browsing for the stuff, and they're playing More Than a Feeling by Boston in an arrangement for string quartet. <laughs> <laughs> I go in the door, I go down the road getting, getting to the thing, and I reach out for my sandwich, and I'm like, just a minute, just a minute, I, I know that music, what's that, what's that? <laughs> I should. I should get, I got a little voice recorder. I should go back and tape it just so, just so I can play it for you. <laughs> I, should just, I stood there in like stunned, absolute stunned silence. And this is, I can't see it, just audio. But you can imagine four string, more, <laughs> the guitar solo comes along. <laughs> I am not kidding. It was a string quartet arrangement of Boston's <laughs> more than a feeling. It might be a thing. Google it. It's probably out there. Google it. 
No, no, I have a little voice recorder. It's a little thing where you, you have a memo, you pick it up and say, okay, secretary, take a memo. Dave says, blah, 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 click on, click off. It's not a phone. It's an actual little voice recorder. I don't carry it in my pocket all the time. I have it up there. Sometime when I'm taking a walk, I throw it in my pocket so that I can remember something that I've, uh, that I've done. <laughs> I should, if I, well, I don't know what, I have no time to go back there today because we're really, really busy. So yeah, if I remember, I'll put the recorder in my pocket and uh, <laughs> we can hear it. <laughs> I can't forget it. <laughs> I wonder if Tom Schultz gets royalties for that. I wonder, I mean, if this, if all the legal buttons have been pressed and clicked, then Tom Schultz, is he still alive? I have no idea. I know nothing about that end of it. If, if Tom's still alive, he, what would he say? Would he take the money or would he rather say, look, no thanks, uh, you can keep the money. But how would you feel, you know, to, to know that your music is out there in a, in a 7-Eleven being played as a parody, an absolute parody of what you created? Do you just take the money and run, or I guess it's out of your control. Once you've released music into the wild and your, your music company has the copyrights and all that stuff and it gets monetized, I suppose that's just part of the game. You just sit back at your pool, and this poolside, and just sip your your margarita and just take the money, I guess. I don't know. What are you going to do? <laughs> Someone's got a version from YouTube. Is this the string quartet? Is this the one? Is this the string quartet version that you guys have found? I guess so. You know, I'm not. I'm not. You know, shooting at anybody here. It just, it just, it just struck me as funny. You know, if I were in charge of creating background music for something like, for this shop or whatever, I don't really think I would think of doing that sort of a thing. But uh, whatever, whatever. I also wonder how many people who wander into the Seven Eleven actually would recognize that. You know, I mean, I don't know. I gotta go back and record it. Absolutely, I gotta go back and record it. <laughs> Actually, there's a there's a sign on the front of all convenience stores, not just 7-Eleven. When you go in, there's big signs. There's a couple of signs. It's no smoking, of course, and there's no helmets. There was a deal back, I don't know, 10, 15, 20 years ago, where you there were a bit of robberies. There's like late at night at, this, at a convenience store, motorcycles would ride up, guys with big helmets, you couldn't see their face. They hit up the cash register, zoom, out they go into the night. So the, the convenience stores now have a bunch of signs. One, no helmets, take off your motorcycle helmet before coming in, you know, so that the security cameras can see you. And there's always signs, no photography. There's the standard camera with a slash mark. I don't know why they really care about that, but whatever.
How is the wood on this block? It's chippy, and you saw, you can see what's happened here to show. There's a, there was a big knot in this area, and when I was coming through here, it wouldn't choose this, wouldn't wouldn't cut this way, wouldn't cut this way. So a bunch of it popped off the plywood. So this is not pretty. Close your eyes, don't look. It doesn't matter, we're okay with this. But it's not pretty, and this is a very chippy, picky, difficult block. And I'm, I'm, being, I'm being a bit chatty here, but I'm also having to be a bit careful, because when we have places like this, a long thin area that comes out when I'm clearing the wood around it if I like right here if I dig a bit too deep right where I am here to clear this part away if I clear a bit too deep it'll knock back and I could lose the tip of this area here no problem for the middle but I could lose the tips so I'm uh, I'm trying to be uh, a little bit careful here while I am here right there look at that if that isn't cut deep enough Let's go and put a bit of extra deep depth here. You could lose this really, really easily. And then it's another half hour's repair job. This is not a pleasant piece of wood here. It's okay. It's going to do its job and the block will print very nicely, we think, when it's done. But it's not a pleasant piece of wood to work with. Did printmakers in the past touch up bad prints, blah, blah, guy with a brush, etc., etc., etc.? That is a good question, and I don't, of course, none of this would be documented or whatever, 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 so I can't, I really don't know. My basic answer is I don't know. I do have information on that point related to 20th century practice, namely the Adachi workshop. And then also the Mokohankam workshop. So I can tell you with, with specific knowledge those two workshops. The Mokohankam workshop, that place where I work, we have a house rule. We don't retouch, period. We don't retouch at all. I've been doing it that way ever since I was my own printmaker. And once we became a group organization like this, we followed the same practice. We don't retouch. It's partly a question of pride. If we can't get it right the first time, what do we, well, you know, we shouldn't be trying to fix it and pass something on as being properly done, which isn't properly done. And I thought, when I you know, set it up myself to do it this way, I would have thought that no self-respecting workshop would ever do this, would ever retouch prints. Kubota-san, talking with him one day, this, this sort of topic came up. I think he had handed in a batch of prints and something was a little weak on one. He said, you guys are going to retouch this up, right, before you send them out? And I'm like, what? He says, you know, like, 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 you know, like a dachi does. And I'm like, what? And he chats with me and, and I don't know current adachi, how they do it. I know nothing about how a dachi does it right now. But Kubota-san described to me a situation, and this is 30 slash 40 years ago. There was a guy there, an elderly gentleman there. His name was Funa. Oh, I've forgotten his name. Not Funabori. I'm, we have a print called Funabori. Fu, Fu, Funabashi-san. He was an elderly gentleman 30 years ago. He's long, 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 long gone. Funabashi-san. And he, he had two jobs at Adachi. One of his jobs was when they were making the color separations. You know, you sometimes see me when I'm doing the color separations, I take Jed's data from Photoshop and I paste it onto a color separation and away it goes. They didn't have that technology, so Funabayashi-san's job was when the... He would have drawn this. 
you know, this block we're doing now. The key block was transferred, and Funabayashi-san would have drawn these wave shapes on the first color block. He was an elderly gentleman, very, very skilled with a brush, and that was his job to do color separations that needed drawing. And Kubota-san said his other job was when a stack of prints came in that the, the eyeballs were too light, he would put in the eyeballs or he would touch up the color here and there. So it has been a thing. It has been a thing. We don't do it. Not because I'm trying to be as pure as the driven snow, but because I want to do this as woodbot prints. I don't want to feel that we've got defective prints that we're fixing to go out. And also because it's really, really, really difficult to do. You've got to know what you're doing. You've got to have super skill with the brush. You've got to get your colors just right. And if you screw it up, it looks awful. So anyway, whatever. So long, short answer. Excuse me. So no, we don't, uh, we don't retouch here. It sometimes seems a shame because there's prints that are almost there. And geez, if we just could, you know, just get the pen out and write a line over there, the print could go out and most people, well, whatever, nobody would know. So it sometimes does seem a shame. Prints are wasted that could otherwise have gone out. But whatever, you're going to make your policy, you make your policy and, and stick with it, you know. So, of course, now that you think about it, you know, in the old days when none of this was art, it was all about the printing business and just, you know, make as many copies and sell as many copies as possible, then I would guess when you think about it, most workshops would have retouched all the way along, you know, whatever they needed to do to get it out the door. So, so yeah, I guess so. How thick is the cherry wood? We've got here that the top of this board is, I don't know, something about four millimeters thick. I don't know. So you see the cherry layer. There's my finger. The board, our, our target dimensions are 23 millimeters for the overall board, five millimeters, five millimeters for each of the cherry. That's our target, target thickness. These are a little bit thin, I think. I can guess why. <clears throat> We've talked about this before. That, as I said, this board, the grain is really wild and weird. And the place we sent this to get shaved down probably made one pass. Whoops, doesn't work that way. Turned it one pass. Whoops, doesn't work that way. They would have struggled to get it smooth. And they maybe took more passes than, than would have been uh, ideal. 
So this one has ended up a little bit thinner than normal. That's also partly why you see this uh, plywood popping through here. This one was a tough one. Have I ever had to carve on green wood? No, we would never do that. Our wood really, really has to be dry and stable. Remember that we're not making wood carvings here. We're making wood block prints. And in order to make a print, well, the block has to be stable, of course. If the block were green, it would be swelling and shrinking, changing shape. We'd never get the colors registered properly at all. So no, 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 no. We need our wood to be very, very carefully dried and cured and as stable as possible. Absolutely. We've got wood upstairs at many, many different stages of drying. There's wood all over the place up there. We recently, I don't know if I mentioned it, we recently bought ourselves a new... Uh, a new storage locker, you know, one of those, you put together pieces to make a storage locker, and it's up on the roof outside. So up outside, uh, above the third floor of this building, there's a new storage locker, and it's full of cherry wood. It's all stacked and stacked and stacked in airspace, and every now and then, Aoyama-san heads up there and restacks it. We've got stacks of wood everywhere, all over the building, at different stages of drying. How's our time? 8.54. Looks like we're running. Okay, I've got work to do here still. This will take us up to show and tell time, I think. We have a moderately interesting show and tell today. Can I control temperature and humidity? No, 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 no. This is all just air drying. Nothing. We're not controlling anything. No, nor would we try to, nor do we want to. This is just natural air drying. It's not, we don't have a kiln drying system here. The best, most stable piece of wood that we could use in our carving would be one that is just over a number of years. It has it has come to its natural. Uh, what's the word? It's just come at rest. It's it's released all the excess moisture that's inside it, and it's now at a state that it takes moisture in a rainy season, dries it out in winter. The wood has just become, you know, stable. If I could move anywhere in the world, where would I move to? You know, we're okay here. We're okay. You don't want any, you know, you don't want to live in Las Vegas where it's all super dry. You wouldn't want to live in a monsoon area. What we want here is exactly what we've got, actually. We, we keep our wood blocks, the ones that are carved, they're production blocks. Most of them stay in my Ome workshop in the first basement. We're a bit near a river there. A danger for wood blocks is if you're in too much of a dry environment and they dry out beyond where the cells can recover and they split. And that's it. You're done then. You want the wood to be able to dry a bit in the winter, breathe the water in in the summer and dry in the winter and breathe it in. You want this sort of yearly cycle going on in your wood. 
So we don't wrap them up in plastic bags. They're on open shelves in my home in Ome, all vertically done so that they don't sit and warp. And they're free to, to breathe, if that's the word. They're not really breathing. So we've got, I think, actually pretty much an optimal environment for taking care of those carved wood blocks. So that in itself is not a problem for us at all. The problem for us is obtaining new, new wood, you know, getting it from the forest over into our system. So many questions. I'm not, I'm not catching a tenth of the questions here. I'm sorry. So, and I doubt today I will have time to read this chat because our, the pattern over the last few days is it's been quiet here, nine, nine thirty, ten, and then coming up to noon. Whoops, here they come, and then it's crazy busy until about three, three thirty or so, and then it gets quiet. This has been our pattern the last few days, anyway. Today's Saturday. It's a weekend. That really doesn't affect it. Tourists don't care that it's Saturday or Monday or whatever day it is. They're here at random days. And going to be nuts today. It's just going to be nuts. Selfies, selfies. I can't count how many selfies we've taken the last few days, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> People are cool about it. You know, they ask really, really politely. I guess there's the feeling that it might be impolite to say, can we have a picture together? I don't really know. I don't, I'm not bothered at all about it. But a lot of the people, they're really, really hesitant to ask. And uh, I know, of course I'm okay. You know. we've, ma we've mentioned this before. It's become sort of a standard deal. Someone has visited, they've looked. They may or may not have bought a print, whatever, it doesn't matter. We've chatted for a while. It's time to go. You get to the end of the conversation, and their hand reaches for their pocket, and then their hand comes out again. And that's my cue. I say, oh, would you like a picture together? Yeah, yeah, please, can we do that? <laughs> so they make this hint, hinting mark with their hand, the people who feel it's a little bit impolite to ask if we can have a picture together, you know. And I'm, I'm in no, no sense that it's impolite at all. I don't care at all. I'm quite happy. So. But there are people who are, are trying to be careful and not to be, uh, not to be uh, bothering, you know. So. And we've got the setup. I know it, it's, we've struggled with this a little bit, but the last few days we've got a setup worked out. I've got... Uh, I got my carving bench here. We've put a stool. There's a stool right in front of the bench. We've got another stool standby. So what we've been falling into a habit of when people ask for a picture, I jump back in here. They sit on the stool and then somebody else. So rather than try the, the selfie thing, we just throw the camera to somebody else. So people are all sort of getting the same picture. It's the picture from over there looking at me. The guest is on the stool and we've got the lantern behind. So that has become the stock visit Mokohanka and take a picture with Dave type of picture. So something too. There's something else about the picture taking that is a, a quirky, interesting thing for me. When there's uh, no, Japanese people here, whatever, if, if this happens, we take a picture. I'm sitting here, the guest is there, and we hear a kachink and then a click. We can hear when the picture's taken, so you know when to relax your face or whatever. You get your face ready, click, you hear it, you can relax your face. With all the foreign visitors, this doesn't happen. <coughs> I sit here, they sit there on the stool, somebody else takes the camera, the person over there is moving the camera around, and I'm waiting, and I never hear the click. Because I, I say everything, without exception, all the foreigners have got the click turned off. It's law in Japan that your camera must click when it takes a picture. 
So actually all these foreigners here with that setting on their phone are actually breaking the law. It's mandatory shutter in Japan. Now, whatever, the police are not going to tackle you on the street and drag you into a dungeon because of this. Tourists are tourists. But just so you know, it is actually, yeah, I know you hate the sounds, I get it, but actually for me as the recipient of the picture, for me as the target here, this happening, I sit down, he sits down, the person is over there, and we get our face ready, and we get our face ready, and is the picture, we get our face ready, and we never know when the picture's taken, so you, 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 you screw it up. If it was a click, we sit here, click, we hear the click, and we know we can relax for a second or two, move your head a little bit, another click comes. So as a receiver, I would much rather have the click there. So it's up to you, whatever, I know, whatever, whatever, whatever. You are supposed to have the click turned on here in Japan. I don't know, I think it's also Korea. I can't I know, speak for that. Korea has had a huge problem with this sort of thing recently, with uh, Whatever, with guys taking inappropriate pictures of women in various places, including like escalators and stuff like this. So Japan, I think, has had less of this, but enough to make it a law. Now the wood grain here, I cut this side going up because it clears away from the wood and the wood grain on this block, that way is smooth. This way is against the grain. So to come back down this one, this is going to be no fun. I can't go up that way because it, it, it would cut into the wood that's being retained. So I've got to cut I've got to cut away from the retained wood, but it is against the grain. And you can see I struggled with this when I was on the... Yeah, look at this. Mm -hmm. So I've got to try and shave just a little bit at a time. Keep lots of pressure on the top of the blade. That'll do it. We'll see. What's happening out there? Is that the uh, Oshibori man, I think? I'm not quite sure. I can't tell. No, different truck.
Someone says, is the ninja experience still going strong? They are gaining strength day by day by day. They've exploded in popularity. Nothing to do with the tourists being here. They had a, <coughs> they had a, they were featured on some variety TV show last week or, or two weeks ago, I can't remember. And they have exploded. They've got new staff. They're hiring people for their drama. The, the kids groups, it's no longer one or two kids at a time doing it. It's like a dozen kids at a time. The murder scene that you saw on my video, what was it? It was three kids, four kids. Now it's like a dozen kids. But I think they're capping each party. It's 10 or 12. I can't see. I'll count next time. So the guy now who, who falls on the floor and they stab him, he's now getting hacked by a dozen kids. And some of them are really, really vicious. There was one we saw yesterday. <laughs> some, I had, the, you know, the people are browsing in our shop. We hear the screaming. So I tell them, hey, chance to see the ninja show. Let's go outside. So we all go outside and watch this. And yeah, you're one of the groups yesterday. The kids are banging, banging, banging. But one kid got his plastic sword and he was driving. He was jabbing this plastic sword into the guy. And the guy starts yelling, hey, enough, enough already, enough already. So <laughs> it's getting worse. Well, worse means better. I mean, you know, whatever. And the kids love it. They just have so much fun. How often do you get to beat up this guy, you know? And they did one. Did I tell you about it the other day where at the denouement scene, the bad guy was here. The bad guy, the way it worked, the bad guy first stabs the ninja teacher. The ninja teacher falls down. He asks his kids for help and they defeat the bad guy. That's the basic outline of the, of the drama that happens here. But the other day they played it with two bad guys and I hadn't seen this. I didn't know what was coming up. The bad guy is here. He stabs the ninja teacher. The teacher falls back. Kids, I need your help. The kids start to do this. And another bad guy parachuted in from upstairs, not parachute, he rappelled down the wall. And I hadn't seen this coming. <laughs> it was... So bad guy number two comes in. All right, now we can take care of you. And the kids scream and scatter and it all comes back to life. <laughs> it's great, great fun. But my God, it's a noisy. And the woman, the bag lady, I haven't talked to her. I can't talk to her about this, but my God, the bag lady. <laughs> and I'm laughing at this, but maybe I would not be laughing quite so easily at this if this ninja experience was in the building next to me here. And all these crowds gathered in front of our shop every two hours for 15, 20 minutes. Nobody can see my shop. Nobody can get in. Nobody can get out. I might not be so uh, easygoing and ha, 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 and isn't this all lots of fun? That might not be my mood if it was me. So we'll see, we'll see, we'll see. <laughs> so the, I think somebody said this before on one of their streams, the bag lady should become a real bag lady. Get out, come out swinging, you know. I think we are finishing up here exactly right in time. I think this is the last cutting. We are approaching show and tell. I could not have made this work any better if I had planned it. Just a bit of cleaning up here. What is the time? 9-11. We are working very well. Try and get rid of the last, you know, the last roughnesses here, the places that are going to catch pigment.
let's break. Show and tell, show and tell, show and tell. My block is done. We have show and tell. Okay, yeah, reminder, I know, I know. There's three things to show, uh, plus the show and tell. So just a minute, just a minute, just a minute, just a minute. I gotta go up and get them. I'll take off the mic. Back in one minute with the extras. Hang on a sec. There's the programmed show and tell. And let's get a couple of extra things. One minute. Yoosh. 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 Sixty prints. I nearly dropped them. What are they? One hundred and thirty-five dollars each. Sixty prints on the floor. Boom. Okay, a couple of things then. Quick, before we do the show and tell, and before we do the great waves, we talked about the prints, the books earlier. Remember what I said? You could be, you could come and be a woodblock printmaker, a woodblock printer. And on your first day, you could be productive. And this was the kind of thing you could have made on your first day. Here we are. These are books. The carving is insane. The carving is insane. The pictures and lettering are all together on a bunch of blocks. These were melodramatic stories, stories of uh, samurai and, and blood and thunder and war and guts and you name it and whatever. And look at the printing quality on this one. So a kid would sit down, he'd come from off the rice fields, where you go, the block is on your thing, they should give him a five minute lesson. Here, look, drop the pigment, rub your brush, bang, bang, drop the pigment, rub your brush, bang, bang. Thousand sheets, you gotta do this before six o'clock tonight. And the kid would do the thousand sheets before six o'clock tonight, whatever it was. So you could be a productive printer on your first day with this kind of level. And I've picked a very, very, very bad example here. Most of them were done a little bit more nicely than this. This is a specifically horrible, awful example. And my guess is a printing that was this bad, the characters are worn out, the face you can't even see. My guess is blocks like this. This is a block set that has already been used the book was published, it was hot, it was printed many, many times, the blocks were sold to somebody else, then sold to somebody else, and this is the millionth reproduction of this page. Not 200, but the 200 millionth, whatever, I have no idea. These blocks were used until they were just a frazzle. There's nothing left, the face line is gone, his nose is gone, the characters in the middle, they're barely readable. Some saying the kids would use the worn out blocks to learn. No, simply this was this would have been printed and sold. There it is, it's a book. There's the cover, it was sold. But this would have been uh, a, what it, a later, 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 later edition. And maybe by now this is out in the boonies. People in the cities knew about this. This was a, a popular novel in the cities in one year, and then five, ten years later, the blocks are worn out. Nobody in the city wants to buy this story. They've all seen it, read it, heard it. But out in the boonies, so the block sets just make their way down from one publisher to another, getting worn out, worn out, worn out, out as they go. Absolute melodramatic crap as of a novel and a print like this. 
a book like this. So it's left over. It's the 1850s. Oh, Mori san is here. No way. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Hi, hi. We're still live. I've got 10 more minutes or so do here. To just come and say hello. I don't know if the people might, if you pop in here, look out. <clears throat> this is somebody maybe you haven't met before. Come here just for a second. Have you been here before like this on the stream? Bit more, bit close, bit close. I'm not going to bite. Just so, this is Mori san. She'll be, she'll be helping me today in the shop. She used to work for us back in the days when we had the print parties to show you were a print party coat. So, 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 so. Okay, I gotta show some pictures. About 10 more minutes, then I'll be happy. She's back. She's back. She didn't say no. Okay, okay, let's go. I've asked her a hundred times to come and join us full time. And a hundred times she said, sorry, Dave, no thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a reason she's actually a career lady. She works for a major telecoms company and she is uh, up, 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 up some like, I don't know, executive level in the company. She likes us. And she works steadily and heavily from that company, but, uh, but she doesn't. She's not about to quit there and her pension and her executive salary <laughs> come here and work for us. But she likes us and she does one or two weekend days a month. No, I said a telecoms company. And it, I, I shouldn't talk more about her because she's a professional lady. Nothing, nothing to do with us. So, okay, what was wrong with the three prints? Where are they? Okay, people who are just joining us, uh, they don't know what's going on. But the other day on the previous stream, we uh, did the first level of inspection of some great wave prints. And the printer sent them to me with this tag that says Yare which means simply reject. And I had a quick look at them on the stream and really couldn't understand what was wrong with them. But uh, I think one of the other staff did notice, Dave, look at this, this is what she's on about. And I'm like, oh yeah, okay, I see it, I see it. And maybe actually somebody on the stream did notice this the other day, but I didn't catch it. One of the blue blocks at the bottom here has been misregistered. And the blue doesn't match the line of the boat here. Look at this. You can see it, it makes the boat look a bit funny. The blue wave doesn't match the edge of the boat. And being a little picky, actually, it's not just there. It's all the way up. So the blue of that doesn't quite match where it's supposed to go all the way around. So it's perhaps most visible right there. And as you saw, I didn't catch it. I sat there and looked at this thing. I looked around and couldn't see it and couldn't see it and couldn't see it. And this is a really good example of trouble I get into. They send me a batch of prints. Now she's marked these. If she hadn't marked these, if she just left them in the stack, do you think I would have caught this? I'm looking at these prints. There's one, oh, looks okay to me, another one, two, put the embossing. There's no way I would have caught this. So this is why we ask the printer, please, if you've got things that you think are no good, separate them or mark them to help me in my job of sorting out what's good and what's bad. So the thing is, when they don't mark them, I go through the stack and I'm thinking, looks good, looks good, looks good. And you keep moving and you're sort of, there's 60 or 100 prints and it's difficult to focus and figure out what's going on. And very, very easy for me to not notice mistakes even mistakes that are larger than this. So we do send prints out. And I've, there's emails in my inbox. In fact, Rod San, are you here? The, the person who links in, in Twitch here as Rod San, there's an email from him in my box from two months ago, three months ago, whatever. He's a regular customer of ours. He's got a lot of prints. He's a subscriber. He got a print from us, the Utamaro Bijinga, and there's a real problem with it. And he sent me a photo and an email saying, Dave, Looks like here's one you might have missed. And he wasn't really complaining, but he would, uh, he would like me to take care of this. And it's still in my inbox, and it's like two months old now. So yeah, yeah, I can be sarcastic and say, saru mo ki kara ochiru. Or I can just tell the truth. I, you know, it's difficult to catch all the mistakes. If you do see something, let me know, and we'll, we'll put it right, or you know, at least do an exchange, or Give you your money back if what you want is your money back, you know. So yeah, Moko Hankan does send out sometimes defects. So Rodson is not here, eh? Okay.
No, no, this lady, Modi-san, it's nothing to do with that tax problem we mentioned before. That previous tax problem <clears throat> was related to housewives who are not the primary breadwinner in their family. There is a husband involved who is the salaryman and how much the housewife is allowed to make on the side. Modi-san is not in that situation. She is, uh, in her own right, an employed person. Nothing to do with that similar problem. No, simply I'm not able to compete. I can't offer telecoms executive level salary. You know, maybe she's happy here. I don't know. We'll get in there one day. We'll get in there. How many levels are we at? Are we in? More tape. <laughs> We shouldn't call this show and tell. We should call this something else. Sorry about this. We'll get in there one day. Place your bets. What are we going to find inside? More tape to open? Two plastic bags? <laughs> show and tell is over. That's right. So, <laughs> hey, I'm happy the guy is sending woodbot prints. You've seen it sometimes. They put the prints in a paper bag, send the paper bag. Too bad it's not reusable. You know, if it had been green tape, we'd be able to reuse it, but this is not that. Hey, okay. Place your bets. More tape or we get to some prints? More tape. <laughs> it's both, actually. <laughs> it's taped to the board here. Cut carefully. Cut carefully. Okay, what we have here are three quiet treasures and one unknown print. This is two auctions from the same guy. He put them up a couple of weeks ago, didn't really know what he had. He knew this was woodblock prints. The one at the back, he didn't know if it was woodblock prints. And I couldn't tell from looking at the picture. So what we've got here are three small prints that are very nice, very old little prints. And we have one unknown object that may or may not be a woodblock print. And actually, I can see already it is almost certainly not a woodblock print. Sometimes when we get on these auctions, we just do our bidding and we get out on it. And uh, we, we take a flyer thinking it could be an interesting print item. This one looked like it could be an interesting print item, but I'm thinking it is not. actually might be a woodblock print, you know? This is printed not on paper, but it's printed on silk. It's nominally a design by, uh, what have we got here? Oh, it nominally says Hiroshige. It's a version of some kind of painting by Hiroshige. It's on silk, backed with paper. And it would have been printed on the silk first, then backed with paper. And the silk now is coming apart in many places. It's fracturing and coming apart and splitting. Even one place down here, there are pieces of the silk coming off the backing paper. And I think, I'm going to have to get this under the microscope to be sure, it looks like a woodblock version of a Hiroshige painting. But it's been done not as a in woodblock stuff, but they've tried to replicate the painting itself. And you're going to ask me details. How do we do this? What's the technique of printing on silk? I do not know. I know nothing about it. I've never tried such a thing. I know that it was a thing back in the older days. Ah, domo, thank you. Omekara, kana? Hi, domo. 
white opaque pigments. This thing is old. It's been beaten up for quite a bit. This thing has been around. It looks brushed, but as I said, I, it, it seems to show cutting when I look under the light. It's been done in imitation of brush style. It hasn't been actually sliced. I don't know. Let me reserve judgment. It could be a woodblock print imitation of brush or it really actually could be brushed. I don't know yet. Let me get it under the microscope later. I'll report back to you what I find. I can't tell about barren marks because one, it's on silk and two, it's been glued to a backing paper. So we have none, nor would we expect to find any barren marks here. It's mounted on a piece of paper. So for the moment, let me hold off on judgment what this is. I'm not sure. I will report back. Right now, carefully out of sight. These, we know what are going on. These are woodblock prints. The guy put up an auction for three of them. They're woodblock prints of what's generically known as the sooty mono type. These are not those glorious, magnificent sooty mono that are printed in a thousand colors. They are small little uh, uh, keepsakes. A poetry group would, would make them. Somebody has had his poem chosen here. We have nice little embossing. This is extremely soft paper. It's unsized. The print factory has made this print on unsized soft paper. It feels like sort of deluxe, I know, what can I say, deluxe toilet paper. It's so soft and thick and luxe. It's a bit of a strange design. Um, I can't tell you who this is. I can't read the designer's name. The last character is pronounced Ga. This might be Hiro. I don't know. I don't know. This is Kita, so it's Hoku. I don't know. Mori-san maybe will be able to help me with this. And maybe is there somebody on the stream who can help us with the reading on this? It's not a name I recognize. <laughs> Mori-san's keeping out of sight. She doesn't want to be on the stream. That's what's up. But it's nicely done. Look at the big, deep, rich embossing. Very nice. No idea. And there are three of them in the auction. So these are going to go through to Watanabe-san. These will be going into our flea market. There's one with a fish, a second one with a bell. And it's the same, uh, the same stamp, the same designer's name. And I'm sorry, I can't in any way read the lettering here. It'll be a poem about something to do with sound because we have a semi and we have a furin, a summer wind chime with a bug on it. So definitely the poem will be something to do with summer sounds, absolutely. And it's haiga style work. This is not delicate ukiyo-e crafting. And this one has two copies. So one for me, one for you. It'll be going out into the flea market. The paper, it's so soft. My God, this is why the, the printing has to be a bit rough and, and rough and ready here because you to, to print on unsized paper, it's a question of splashing the water on and just bang, one touch and getting it go. You can't vigorously rub, 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 or it sticks to the front of the paper which dissolves when you pick it up. So it's a very rough and ready printing style on unsized paper. And the, the end result is beautifully, beautifully soft. 
<laughs> She's waiting. <laughs> she won't come in. It's okay. Let's sign off. Okay, we're done. We're done. We're done. Let me poke up the outside camera. Today's Saturday. I'll be back here two more days. Uh, as far as jobs go, I could be, I've said the same thing now for a couple of weeks. I could be working on next year's series or it could be still more work on the surfer girl. Right now, me and Mori san got to get ready because it's going to be chaos in the shop here today. The paper is called Hosho, Hosho paper, and it's unsized Hosho paper. Let me get up, out. Okay, I'll be signing off. See you in a couple more days. Thank you very much for your cooperation. I'm really going to enjoy it. <laughs> What's that? That's your water bottle? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Away we go. Bye-bye for now. Thank you.